We'll now move to the Esri Conservation Technology Showcase, facilitated by our friend and colleague, David Smetana. This will be followed by a Q&A session. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our Conservation Summit Technology Update. My name is Dave Smetana, and I'm a consultant with Esri's Professional Services. I support our conservation customers worldwide who are using ArcGIS to serve their business and information needs. Today, my colleagues and I will focus on the ArcGIS solutions for conservation that we first released in early 2020. I'll start with a brief introduction of the conservation solutions available today. Uh, my colleague, Matt, from our solutions team will provide an early look at the next solution we'll release that will support park infrastructure management. Um, my colleague, Lucy, will show us some examples of advanced customization that you can use in your own solution deployments. And finally, Vinay will demonstrate some of the imagery management and analysis capabilities that are also available in ArcGIS. Let's get started with a brief introduction to the ArcGIS solutions for conservation. Esri is known in the conservation community for its ArcGIS desktop and server GIS software. And it's widely used by governments, corporations, researchers, and nonprofits worldwide to organize, analyze, and visualize their, cons their conservation data and activities. Esri also hosts its GIS capabilities in the cloud for any organization to access securely through a browser or an Esri app. Esri's web GIS, called ArcGIS Online, enables more members of an organization to use and benefit from GIS technology in their work. It also enables GIS professionals to serve more needs, requiring less hardware and training for those end users to participate in GIS workflows. ArcGIS Online has been designed to provide comprehensive GIS capabilities that are ready to use. First and foremost, each organization controls access and rights to all their data that they create in ArcGIS Online. Not every organization, however, has extensive GIS data available to work with. ArcGIS Online Living Atlas includes thousands of maps and layers with ready to use content that covers the globe, including satellite imagery, environmental and human data sets, and even live weather, fire, traffic, and conflict layers for the world. The Map Viewer included provides map making and data visualization tools. And ArcGIS Online also includes a series of web and mobile applications that can be configured to serve information workflows, such as field data collection, spatial analysis, and automatic reporting. These capabilities enable you to create a seamless information workflow, giving each member of your organization the data and tools that they need in their day-to-day -day activities. Hundreds of thousands of organizations around the world rely on ArcGIS Online every day to conduct their business. Esri recognized that conservation organizations in particular, um, those managing protected areas could use these ArcGIS Online capabilities, but some template workflows could really help establish those initial capabilities. The ArcGIS solutions for conservation are a configuration of ArcGIS Online maps and apps that are designed specifically to serve the common workflows used in protected area management those being um, national parks, community reserves and forests, or private nature reserves. Working primarily with African organizations, ESRI developed the ArcGIS Solutions for Conservation to serve protection operations, wildlife management, and community outreach teams. The solutions provide digital field data collection forms for field staff, web applications for analysts, and live dashboards for manager decision-making. The solutions are available in any ArcGIS Online organization, and they can be loaded as many times as you need to enable these workflows for a single protected area, or for a national system, or maybe even for transboundary or transnational conservation areas that are being collaboratively managed between agencies. Let's take a closer look at the digital forms and maps and apps that are provided. Here's my ArcGIS Online organization, and you can see that I'm logged in securely to access. Here is the app launcher, which gives me access to the solutions. You can see that you can filter on a number of different types of solutions that Esri created for different industries around the world. 
in conservation, we can support easement monitoring, wildlife management for monitoring uh, wildlife, protection operations to serve anti-poaching and law enforcement activities, and the community outreach solution to serve human and wildlife conflict uh, mitigation. Let's look at one of these solutions. So here you can easily deploy with a click and this loads the maps and apps into your organization. Once loaded, you see in ArcGIS Online that you have a number of layers, maps, and apps that have been created to serve the workflow. I'll walk through some of these apps very quickly and then show you some of the resources to help you deploy on your own. In the protection operation workflow, uh, we have enabled a form for digital field data collection on a smartphone or mobile device. We have a web application for managing the data that's coming in and doing quality uh, assessments of that data, a dashboard for managers to monitor the activities of their patrols, and uh, an analysis tool that allows you to do spatial analysis on that data as you collect it. Here's a view of the field data collection form, and you can see that a ranger in the field using their smartphone can collect a variety of, of information about an incident that they find in the field, whether it's an anti poaching uh, incident or collecting evidence or maybe even a tip from an informant or community member that um, alerts them to some illegal activity. When that data is submitted, it immediately goes into ArcGIS Online and each record is stored. And in the office, a data reviewer can use this web application to look at the data that's come in and monitor its progress in the workflow. If this record is accepted as is, it can be moved forward into a completed status. Once data is approved, it can then go into a management dashboard. And this dashboard is showing the observations that we've just submitted earlier. And it allows a manager to see the details that might be collected in that field data collection form. Finally, as the data comes in and it accumulates over time, you have this web application for an analyst to use to get access to the data to be able to um, filter it based on time or the types of attributes that you're collecting. You can also um, look at, at the, the different layers that you've added to your map or use Esri's available base maps such as imagery. And most importantly, you can use the built-in spatial analysis tools to actually perform analysis. So you can create densities or aggregations of your data to really look at what are the trends in, in the data that are coming in. Also, you can then generate reports so we can print a map or a, a formatted output that can then be emailed. That's a very quick introduction to how the solutions are deployed in ArcGIS Online and what you can do with them. If you wanna get more details, our solutions team has created documentation for each of the solutions. We also have a story map that outlines how these solutions were designed and um, how they serve the common needs of protected area managers. You can also try out the apps here uh, if you don't have access to ArcGIS Online already. Once you do get access to ArcGIS Online, you'll have the opportunity to deploy with your teams. And we've written an implementation guide that will give you some pointers and guidelines for the steps you'll need to take beyond the technical uh, deployment of the tools, what you might need to consider in terms of um, other technology and training. 
here. And I'll just show you the links here to those resources. I hope that was uh, uh, a good introduction and feel free to reach out with any questions. Next, uh, we'll talk with Matt from our solutions team about the next ArcGIS solution that we will release. Hi, Matt. Hi, Dave. So today I wanna to talk about um, our park infrastructure management solution. And so this is an, a release we're gonna be having coming up in the fall, and then we'll have subsequent releases to continue to build out the solution. So the park infrastructure management solution is built around the ability to, or providing the ability for conservation organizations to be able to either create a digital asset inventory of their protected areas or integrate what they may already have with data and continue to build on that. So it gives you a nice way to inventory your solution or inventory your assets within your protected area, but then also perform inspection and maintenance workflows within that. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the apps that we'll see within the park infrastructure management solution. And so, as I mentioned before, this is a solution that allows you to inventory and, and or conduct an inventory of your assets. Give, I'll show you all of the information associated that's happening within a protected area, whether you're bringing existing information in or in particular, being able to create new inventories of information and assets in your protected area. So we know this is important in addition to all of the, the duties that are happening within a protected area of uh, wildlife management and protection operations, as, as Dave showed. Um, so now we're gonna talk about how kind of the, the, the kind of inspection and maintenance and inventory to get that great information and be able to share it to those same workers that are out doing that, the other activities. Um, so what we see here, we're looking at my mobile device and this is ArcGIS Field Maps. So this is a nice mobile, mobile app that we've released some maps that you can take offline into the field with you. And so we see some, a variety of assets that have already been collected. So in this case, it's a particular campground with some trail information. So really kind of that tourist, that public visitor information that you wanna be coming in and sharing that out. And so I can go ahead and collect a variety of uh, asset types and these are all what we call feature templates. So just think of them as ready to go collectible assets that you can configure and wire up to, to your needs or just use them right out of the box and start going. And so I can go in and say, let's, let's correct a new, so in this case, a structure, so a building that we wanna collect. And then I can add all of my asset information, submit that out. In this case, for the purposes of our time here, I'm just gonna go ahead and move ahead. So if I wanted to look at some, like a particular trailhead here or a trail, I can see all of the nice information about that particular trail. If there was an, uh, an issue I needed to report as a mobile worker at the protected area, I can create a service request. So open a form, I can submit the type of request it is, put that in, we, maybe we need to do, we saw some damage or uh, some weather related incidents, something got washed out, we need to go repair that. And so there's a, in kind of in the middle of the screen here, there's a couple of tables that are related to the assets. So for maintenance and inspection activities, you can configure these and really go through that full kind of maintenance inspection activity on your assets. And so we've you could collect some information in the field, submit service requests, do inspection and maintenance activities and field maps. So let's go ahead and move back into the office and have this ability to now review information that, that was submitted from the field. And so you'll notice on the map, it's. Uh, what we're seeing here is a kind of re a refined or like a, a particular view of the data that allows me to only show information that's not been reviewed yet and it's been submitted from the field. And so I can go in and look at assets. So maybe you want to look at this particular restroom that's been submitted and I can get information on that. Or maybe I want to go ahead and just go edit that feature. And so this will allow me to get all of the attribute information that's been submitted from folks in the field. Uh, I can look through and review it. Everything looks good. Uh, we have our asset ID and all of the associated attributes that we want. And there's this field here called reviewed. So it's marked, automatically marked as it's submitted from the field and from ArcGIS field maps, push to, push to this app. I can look at it and say, is this reviewed, yes or no? So we're gonna go ahead and say, yes, this has been reviewed. And that'll go ahead and update and it's gonna drop off the map for me. So I've gone, gone through that review process, that QC review process. 
And also, so the same look and feel, this is a different app configuration, but it's a, we're thinking of this as kind of you're creating and updating your data. So you're actually doing the data editing here. That's kind of the, before we were doing review, now we're doing data editing and actually can go in and add a feature. And just like we saw in the field maps, we have all of these nice features available to us to create. Uh, maybe you want, I want to drop in a new gate. So we have some, some fencing and gate abilities here. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in a new gate. And so that'll put a, put a new gate on the map for me. And then I can fill out all of the associated information. So show me the status of this. Is this uh, a, a temporary or permanent uh, gate? For, other things might be open and closed that we can do from a status capability. Uh, I can do, the, is this a seasonal component? Uh, what's the gate? Is this a, you know, it does, does the public have access to these gates or is this administrative only? Is it, is it visible to the public? So that's kind of a key point and we'll see this in a little bit. Uh, is, is this gate or pretty much any of the assets that you can collect, you'll have this public, visi public visibility, yes, no capability. So we'll see how that kind of um, carries out in the, in the next step. And I can go through and kind of fill out all this information add that feature, it's gonna now show up on a map. It's gonna show up in our field maps and all of the associated everywhere, all the information products of the apps and the maps that we are available to our staff. Yeah, so we've created some- ArcGIS Online takes care of synchronizing that in those edits and whether they come in from the field through the mobile app or whether they come in through this editor web app, you're able to have ArcGIS Online take care of the synchronization of the information across all the teams. And then I noticed in this application, the first one, you were able to collect assets standing at them in the field. In this one, in the web browser, you could also turn on the aerial imagery that's avail available and drop assets on features that you know are where they are. So if you Absolutely. can't get everywhere in your protected area, but you want to go and collect the asset information, you could do that using the provided imagery or topography topographic maps. Absolutely. Yep. And so we've created our information and now we want to go ahead and be able to mark some information. So whether it's an area that, so it's like a weather related incident, or we just want to remove some information or update the visibility to the public of particular assets in the park. And so in this case, we're looking at that same view of the map, but it's a nice, simple blue, red, symbology marking, is this open or closed? And is it visible or not visible to the public? So it's just showing up in our public maps. And so I have this ability to create a, a new closure. So the same area that we've been looking at, let's go ahead and take and create a new closure. And I'm gonna go and say uh, maintenance. This is a maintenance closure. And this is gonna be for, it's a temporary closure. You'll notice there's weather related, whether it's a safety issue or hazardous conditions. So we're just gonna say this is a renovation. And this is some, this, we're, just, we're just starting this activity and it should be wrapped up in the winter. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just copy this over to the comment section. That's gonna go ahead and we'll save this out. That's gonna go, show up now as our label on the map. And that's gonna be important to, or just a nice visual representation of like what's happening in the closure. You can put all types of information in that comment field. It'll show up as a label. And so thinking about from the public perspective, I can go in and look at uh, this nice ability to, we have another, another solution called recreation outreach that can be deployed side by side as, as Dave showed earlier, how you can deploy a solution. You can deploy recreation outreach and have that all that internal workflow and share that information with the public. And so in this case, we have a nice park locator. This will open up a, a very mobile friendly app. I can go ahead and search for, air, if, I could, if I want a particular area I'm looking for, I can search for that. Let's go ahead and just kind of dive in. I know I want to look at this particular area here. And it'll give me a variety of, of in this case, if I had a variety of protected areas or parks I wanted to show, but it could just show if you just have one, one area you want to highlight, it would show up on this. Um, and, get, and you can see a variety of information and activities you can do there, contact information, any type of amenities you want to highlight and share with the public. And then you'll notice that 
that closure that we showed up with, um, I have that ability to go in and share this information with the public. Uh, if you wanted to mark that uh, open and closed activity um, or that's visible to the public and show up in this public map. Um, so it just gives you a really nice from a public interface perspective, simple app, give me all of the associated amenities and things I can do within the protected area. But also on from the protected area side, the, the staff side, we can say, I don't wanna show these particular roads, these particular gates and fencing information. I wanna pull that off the map. The public doesn't need to be engaging with those areas. Um, so you can really kind of drive the information you share publicly. Yeah. All right. So, yep. Nice set of tools. Um, thanks, Matt. And I think uh, everyone will be excited to see these released soon. All right. Next, next we'll uh, talk with Lucy and we'll check in on some of the advanced customizations that you can enable in your ArcGIS solutions for conservation. Thanks, David. Hi, everyone. My name is Lucy Coleman. Today, we're gonna to take a look at two examples of customized deployments of the ArcGIS Solutions for Conservation, known as PAM. Over the last few months, I've been working with both of these organizations through professional services engagements, but everything you'll see today is configurable and you can do on your own as well. So let's jump in. The Los Lava team started by deploying the PAM solutions. However, very quickly, they realized they needed to track many more metrics than were provided through those solutions. So together, we were able to combine several of the PAM surveys, adding additional questions as needed, and even incorporating a patrol, cap, a patrol tracking capability. And this gave us the data we needed to configure their dashboard accordingly. So let's take a look closer. In order to store the data over time, we're using a combination of both a survey one, two, three, seen here on the left, as well as quick capture here on the right. Quick capture allows us to capture the patrol route as we're walking, flying, driving. Um, and in survey is where rangers are actually capturing their observations. And you can see in our survey here, we have a link which actually launches quick capture open. And then back in survey, I can submit information about my patrol, as well as information about each observation um, that I see on my patrol, and I can add additional ones throughout the patrol. This combination of survey and quick capture gives Loisaba all the data that they need to power that dashboard. So let's take a closer look there. Immediately, as you see this dashboard, I'm sure you get a sense there are many more elements here than are contained in the, the typical PAM dashboards. Um, adding those additional elements is a really quick process. We just click up here in the top right to add an additional element. We have to make a choice at this point, which element type is most appropriate. And then once we choose that type, we just wire it up to our data source. In our case, we see a, a combination here of indicators, serial charts, pie charts, list elements, et cetera. On the left, we've also included a filtering component where we can filter the data to a specific range of post or to a specific day. I have the dashboard here set to view yesterday's data. A key metric for the LaSalva team was, was tracking patrol coverage. Let's take a look here at a slightly modified version of the dashboard where managers can track progress per month. And we see here a patrol coverage indicator. This indicator is made possible through the use of Arcade feature sets. Let's take a quick look. Leveraging Arcade, we first input our patrol tracks as a variable here. And then th through a sequence of geoprocessing, we buffer those patrol tracks, take their area and union those together per month. And the output here gives us data on the fly in the dashboard which, which eliminates the need to do this kind of on the fly geoprocessing. We don't have to do that in ArcGIS Pro. The last thing that I wanted to point out is some of the stylistic elements. Each element includes a title and a description. Let's take a look here at the serial chart. You can see within the title, 
It's effectively a rich text component, which means we can incorporate small snippets of HTML here to incorporate our organizational branding. Let's take a look at our second example back here in my slides. The American Prairie Reserve is based in northern Montana. They manage over 400,000 acres of prairie, including herds of bison across these properties. Many of their bison, many of their bison wear collars as well to track their locations over time. American Prairie actually works with the Earth Ranger team to view their bison locations in real time. However, the American Prairie team wanted to see all of their collar data in one place over time, regardless of kind of the collar provider, whether it was Talonics, Vitronics, etc. The American Prairie Reserve was able to integrate the Earth Ranger data tracking those bison collar locations into ArcGIS Online. So let's take a look how that's possible. The process starts here where Earth Ranger uploads uploads the color locations, these track points, into ArcGIS Online as a hosted feature layer. That data is, is input by EarthRanger at some predefined interval. In our case, to meet, the, to meet the American Prairie Reserve's needs in order to see that information over time, we're also doing a bit of post-processing on these track points in order to enrich the data with a few additional attributes in order to power our dashboard. That enrichment process occurs here through, through the use of an ArcGIS notebook. Just a few lines of Python here to add those additional fields and return them in a derivative data product, which is incorporated into our dashboard. You can see here, now that this data has these additional attributes, we can start to filter the data per year, per month, and we see indicators across the bottom here updating as I swap between months. We can also start to track for a specific subject name. These are kind of those caller IDs. We can also start to filter this data for a specific caller ID or subject. And because ArcGIS is open and interoperable, this same pattern can be used to integrate and connect to many other data sources and technologies. With that, I'll pass it back to David. Thanks very much, Lucy. Uh, two really nice examples where we're using available ArcGIS capabilities to reduce how much data processing people have to do to have their data coming directly from the field, from different technologies, right into ArcGIS, into their management dashboards and, and, um, and apps. So uh, this is really nice stuff. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Vinay and uh, take a look at ArcGIS imagery management and analysis capabilities. Hello, everyone. I'm Vinay Vishwambaran. I'm a principal product manager on the imagery team here at ASRI. And today I'm here to talk a little bit about the imagery and remote sensing capabilities we have in ArcGIS and how it really applies to you. So we're here to talk about imagery and rasters. Now, what can we do with all this imagery and raster data in ArcGIS? Well, the real answer is a lot. When we talk about imagery in ArcGIS, we're really talking about a massive category of functionality that spans multiple pieces of interrelated software. To make it easier to understand everything ArcGIS can do with imagery, we can divide all that functionality into five sub-capabilities. Content refers to both the content that we support as well as online imagery, terrain, and GIS layers we provide from the Living Atlas. Image management capabilities lets you catalog, publish, and consume imagery efficiently and securely. While image mapping, you can create authoritative maps and products from imagery that's collected by drones, aerial sensors, or satellites. With image analysis, ArcGIS provides advanced analytical tools to extract location-based information from imagery. And lastly, visualization and exploitation capabilities leverage human interpretation to extract information from imagery. The result is a rich system for anything users want to do with imagery. 
ArcGIS supports an extensive list of raster formats. For many formats, we don't just bring in the pixels, but also the metadata associated with the imagery. We also support all kinds of different platforms and sensors, including aerial imagery, imagery from satellites and drones and terrestrial imagery. In addition to platforms, we support different modalities of imagery as well. Everything from multispectral data, LIDAR, video, 360 inspection imagery, scientific data, and so on. ESRI also offers content in the form of web-enabled services. This includes the latest releases of Analysis Ready Sentinel-2 and Landsat 8 data, over five petabytes of surface reflectance imagery that you can access via the internet. ESRI partners also often share their content through services to make it accessible. This massive library has earth observation layers and landscape layers, which will let you do things like look through these images through time, capture features, trace fire scars. It can help you with conservation decision-making such as where valuable natural assets are located, such as location of wetlands, certain vegetation types, and hydrological features. With ArcGIS Image for ArcGIS Online, You've got the ability to store your imagery long-term, updated on the frequency you've updated your imagery. You can centralize your imagery inventory for protected areas. You can serve it out for visualization. You can analyze it for deriving information products like burn scar maps, localized or more frequent land cover, human settlement maps. What's more important to call out is that with ArcGIS Image for ArcGIS Online, you no longer have to care about your infrastructure. Your data is managed and online, and you only have to worry about the science and the analysis. The ArcGIS system it comes with a suite of tools and capabilities to perform analysis and derive information products. You can assess wildlife corridors, identify first responder management areas, model fire growth, model flood zones, perform anomaly detection. And these are really just some of the capabilities that I've highlighted here. Now let's switch gears and run through a few demonstrations that highlight how you can use ArcGIS in your conservation efforts. Before anything, I'll give you a tour of the Living Atlas and briefly show you how it can help you with conservation decision making. ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World has tons of imagery content that's contributed by Esri, our partners, and our user community. The content is organized around different categories. The environment category includes raster and imagery layers under subcategories such as earth observation and land cover. These layers, they can be used in suitability analysis and susceptibility analysis and other relevant workflows to conservationists. One of the many data sets is the ESRI 2020 land cover layer, which displays a global map of land use land cover. Here's the land cover for Kenya. This layer was produced from ESA Sentinel-2 imagery at 10 meter resolution. So let's explore the area around Lake Nakaru. The classes are derived from a composite of deep learning predictions throughout the year to generate a representative snapshot for 2020. The imagery category also includes base maps. These services are designed for visualization purposes and they're heavily optimized for performance. The World Imagery Base Map, it provides satellite and aerial imagery at a resolution of one meter or less for many locations. Living Atlas includes multispectral imagery, which provides additional bands outside the visible spectrum, enabling the creation of derivative products, which enhance specific characteristics such as land water delineation and vegetation health. Then we have temporal imagery. It contains recent and historical imagery which you can use for comparison and analysis. Event imagery, which includes imagery of significant national and environmental events, such as this map of the Kiloa volcano eruption in 2018. This is the Worldview 3 imagery from before the eruption. Here is the imagery during the eruption, and here's the same imagery displayed with the shortwave infrared wavelength, which helps us to peer through the smoke. Here's another view displayed with the near infrared wavelength. ArcGIS Living Atlas of the World also includes apps. This is the Landsat Explorer app. It's driven by the Landsat services 
and the Landsat image services are updated every day with over 700 new satellite scenes. It provides access to over a petabyte of global imagery over time, and it's free for everyone to use. It's also a useful tool for the, the app, the Landsat Explorer, is also a useful tool for imagery analysis. Now let's go back to Lake Nakaro. Now Landsat is multispectral data, so we can view the imagery with different band combinations, and the default agricultural render provides a good view of this location. Landsat is also temporal, so we can compare imagery between different dates. And we're currently looking at imagery from August 2021. Let's compare this with earlier imagery so we can see how this area has changed over the years. So here's a simple visual comparison using the swipe tool. We can see the size of the lake has increased and the urban area to the east of the lake has also increased in size. With the change detection widget, we can compute the change between the two dates. This is the change in a vegetation index. We can also compute the change in the water index and the change in the urban index. Areas in green are where the urban index has increased, while areas in red or magenta are where urbanization has decreased. The result is interesting, but what really makes Landsat Explorer useful is that we can save this result to my ArcGIS online organization and use it in downstream maps and applications. Now that I've saved this result, I simply go to my ArcGIS online organization, refresh my content list, and we can see the analysis result from the Landsat Explorer at the top of the list. I'll click on it to open the item details page, open it in a 3D scene viewer, and here we can continue our analysis of the changes to the lake and surrounding areas. The next set of demos are highlighting our imagery capabilities on ArcGIS Online, essentially our SaaS offering. The scenarios are identifying burn scars and then identifying infrastructure that can be affected by these fires using advanced feature extraction techniques, and then a demonstration on identifying conservation priorities as part of the 30 by 30 initiative. Hosting and analyzing imagery data is vital to the work of many organizations. The new ArcGIS image for ArcGIS Online provides hosted imagery capabilities along with visualization and advanced RAST analytics in the cloud. Last year, approximately 10,000 fires burnt 4.3 million acres in California. Now to better understand the impact and severity, we'll analyze the area near Santa Rosa using the new ArcGIS image. For our analysis, we'll be using a collection of satellite scenes over this region. These scenes, they currently reside on my local machine. Now let me show you how easy it is to get these images hosted on ArcGIS Online. You can create an imagery layer. It could be a static tiled imagery layer or a dynamic imagery layer, which enables dynamic mosaicing and server-side on the fly processing. Specify the layer configuration, your data type, which in this case would be Sentinel. Specify additional properties such as processing templates and other parameters. And then all you need to do is drag and drop your imagery and metadata. Provide additional item description like your title and the tags and create your imagery layer. Now, in the interest of time, I pre-created the layer and added it into my map, and it's ready for analysis. This is our area of interest. To begin our analysis, I can apply a raster function. We can fire up the raster function editor. The raster function editor provides you with access to more than 150 different raster functions. These functions can now be chained to create custom workflows like this one, which essentially evaluates burn severities. So all you need to do is tweak your parameters and run analysis. I've pre-processed this data, approximately 3,000 square miles worth of data. 
and this is what it looks like. Here's the burn severity map and everything in orange depicts high burn severity regions. Next, we also want to know how many structures were in the path of the fire. And because we don't have building footprints previously mapped, we can leverage the new deep learning tools that are provided with ArcGIS image. You specify high resolution imagery for building footprint extraction. We've received imagery from Airbus. Then you can choose from a library of deep learning models that we've provided on the Living Atlas. This includes models for land cover classification, pixel classification, road feature extraction, and more specifically in our case, building footprint extraction. Let's take a look at the results. The model was able to extract 25,000 building footprints, and we were able to determine 1,500 structures here in blue, which were within the burn perimeter. So this was just one example of using ArcGIS image for hosting large imagery collections and performing advanced raster analysis. Now let's look at conservation at a national scale. The 30 by 30 initiative is about preserving 30% of our lands and oceans by the year 2030 for a sustainable future. Here are the areas already protected within the United States. Roughly 12% of the lands and 23% of the oceans correspond to an assigned gap status one and two, which requires permanent protection of its natural state. Overlaying the managed federal lands, we can see a broader area covered, color-coded by managing agency. In order to achieve our conservation goals and get to 30%, we may want to identify areas of the federal land that are suitable for additional protection and new areas across the United States with a high priority in our conservation efforts. To answer the question where to focus our efforts, we collected available resources on the Living Atlas to build a national inventory of information layers, which will help us define the characteristics of the landscape. The first example data set is the National Land Cover data set that's created by multiple federal agencies using different variables like vegetation type, development density, and agricultural use. The next data set created by the conservation scientist, David Theobald, shows human modification across the United States. The darker the red, the larger the human influence on the area. The third example shows biodiversity importance generated by nature served. The brightest colors indicate where multiple imperiled species occur and are not currently safeguarded. These are just three examples of the information we've loaded into ArcGIS image for ArcGIS Online to create a collection of 27 layers describing the land characteristics across the United States. Using Rasta Analytics, we created the first national map of minimally disturbed natural areas, also known as green infrastructure. This layer is not just a visual description of the location, but also an information-rich dataset that allows us to perform analytics and help us answer where to prioritize our conservation efforts. Conservation priorities are not always the same for everyone, and as a result, it requires input from multiple stakeholders. This web application, it allows us to leverage the benefits of the dynamic imagery layer and help us narrow down potential conservation areas based on different scenarios. Now let's assume that we would like to expand the conservation area around Yellowstone National Park. Looking at the federal lands, the immediate vicinity is managed by the Forest Service. So we'll prioritize forest and biodiversity for the scenario. The result of this analysis is a weighted overlay highlighting areas of higher conservation priority in dark green. Now we can look at a different scenario focusing wetlands instead of forests. We can change the weights and get an alternative answer. Let's try one more, wildlife conservation corridors. When we start to look at this from a larger context, 
We can discover the natural network forming pathways across the United States, like this one that connects from the Grand Teton to the Upper Green River Valley and south into Colorado, which happens to be the largest pronghorn migration corridor in North America. As most of the corridor falls around BLM lands, this analysis shows possible areas for additional federal conservation and protection. So that was just one example of using ArcGIS image for ArcGIS online for sustainability and conservation use cases. This next demo, I'll showcase the new change detection wizard in ArcGIS Pro and how we use that to proactively identify ecosystems that will potentially be affected in the future. Human settlement patterns are continually going to consume the hinterlands of natural areas. Therefore, to stop the spread of this unsustainable sprawling growth, one might consider proactively engaging in conservation activities to protect those portions of the landscape that are projected to change. Our partner Clark Labs has developed a global land cover map predicted out to the year 2050, now available as an image service on the Living Atlas. We can compare predicted land cover to the current data to see how urban areas may change. The new change detection wizard guides users through three possible workflows, detecting categorical change, pixel value change, and time series change. In this case, we are really looking for ecological assets that are projected to change to urban areas. So we pick our current data and our predicted land cover map specify the land cover changes we are interested to see, and hit preview. The results are rendered on the fly. Let's tear out the 2018 map so we can intuitively do a side-by-side -side comparison. We can now explore the predicted urban growth across the planet. For example, Johannesburg, Nairobi, Zimbabwe, Newcastle, and more. This ability to forecast landscape changes and how they can affect highly valuable ecological assets will enable us to decide areas where we need to focus our conservation efforts on. This next demo, we model landscape layers into the future to identify how marine ecosystems can be potentially affected in the future due to climate change. Coral reefs are home to 25% of marine species, making them one of the most important ecosystems on the planet. Now, due to rising ocean temperatures, reefs are also one of the most vulnerable ecosystems. So it's rather critical that we understand how these ecosystems will be impacted today and in the future. If we can predict future risk, we can take action today to mitigate impacts of climate change. For this analysis, we've used an image cube that has 2000 weekly slices of sea surface temperature data collected over the past 35 years. This data set can be found on the Living Atlas. The first step is to analyze the temperature trends over our image cube. On the multidimensional tab, we select the trend analysis tool, which extracts trend information for every single pixel in our data set over time. We choose the harmonic trend type to account for seasonality. The result is a trend analysis raster containing model coefficients, and it shows increasing temperature trends in the red areas on this map. The next step is to take this data as an input into the prediction tool, where for the first time we can perform predictive analysis using large scale raster data. The result is a global prediction map of monthly sea surface temperatures predicted out to 2030, and that's all generated on the fly. Now that we have a predicted data set, we can perform analysis by quickly creating a temporal profile and this explores regions and ecosystems that will be affected by future temperature increases. For example, here off the coast of Mexico, you can see a graph that shows the cyclical temperature patterns due to seasonality. However, 
the red trend line shows that the area is clearly predicted to increase in temperature. We can take this predictive analysis a step further, and with a series of geoprocessing tools, we can create a time series risk map to visualize areas that are experiencing prolonged heat stress. And these are really the areas that are most susceptible to coral bleaching. The analysis was done completely from within ArcGIS Pro. Now for the developers and data scientists, you can scale your earth sciences. You can perform this workflow purely using the ArcGIS API for Python. Now we've got the predicted risk of bleaching. We've enriched key station points along reefs with the values we've derived. And finally, we can communicate this high level information through an interactive dashboard, which gives us a dynamic view of coral stress for varying periods of time predicted into the future. With this kind of information, reef managers and conservationists can engage in actions that would help to reduce other stressors on the reef that can further exasperate thermal stress. And with that, here I'll leave you with the uh, resources. More specifically, I'd like to point you to our Imagery Workflows website, which is really an aggregation of a bunch of tutorials, blogs, videos, and training material for you to get started with imagery and remote sensing workflows in general. Okay, thank you to the tech team for showcasing the capabilities with um, the ArcGIS Conservation Solutions. So I'll just invite my colleagues again uh, to share their webcams and just uh, to address some of the questions that have co been coming in during the presentation. So again, Matt will read out the questions which will be addressed by the presenters. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Pauline. I can see David. I think others might be on audio. So I'm just going to pick out a few questions. We've had lots of great ones in. Uh, lots of thanks coming into the presentations as well. So to our speakers, I think they're all here now. So our first question um, is from Samuel. Uh, quite a quick, quick tech question. Um, is it possible to collect the polylines and polygons using the mobile apps? Uh, David, maybe that one for you. Yeah, there's actually a collection of mobile apps available with um, ArcGIS. I believe, um, you know, in the video we're showing using um, Quick capture to collect the line, the patrol tracks. You can also use another mobile application called Field Maps to collect points, lines, and polygons. That's more of a map based interface uh, that enables you to collect new features and also update and edit existing features. Um, so there's a couple of different ways to collect different geometries using mobile devices. Fantastic. And thank you, David. Just to extend that question again uh, from Mervyn, he's asking around the um, sort of tracking abilities of the mobile apps as well. Um, yeah. Um, back. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the Quick Capture app, when it's recording a point or a line, it's recording to the device. And when you uh, are submitting, it if you are connected, it will push that observation or that track up into ArcGIS Online and, and be available to any dashboard uh, or other web application that you're using. ArcGIS Tracker is another mobile app built into ArcGIS Online that allows you to live stream the location of your users. So Tracker um, keep, will continuously update your staff locations. Uh, it also records 30 days of track history, but it's not a permanent recording of data 
of geometry. And so you, you don't use tracker uh, for necessarily for collecting the geometry to preserve through time. You would use one of the other apps to do that. We also have tools, developer tools, where you can take the tracker data and record it permanently using scripts or um, you know, other methods. Thanks very much, David. And so I'm going to combine a few questions from Susan. And Susan, if you're on, thank you for all the great questions you've been submitting. Um, so she asked one for the panelists earlier, which I'm going to bring down for you guys. But so in two parts, uh, she's asking around as the RGS for conversation spreads and is shared across organizations, um, there's been a lot of talk today about quality control, um, things like timestamps and so forth. Are they built into the technology? And how in general is Esri addressing the sort of data quality and, and data security? I'll leave that part there and I'll come to part two in a moment. Okay, and maybe thanks. David. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so first I'll talk to the ArcGIS solutions. And in that field data collection, reporting up to management workflow for wildlife management or for the protection operations or for the community outreach, we have included a quality control data reviewer app. And so as an organization implements the solutions, they have the option to use that data reviewer app to check every single record that's submitted from the field and edit it, um, change the status before it goes into a dashboard. Uh, so you can configure the workflow to have data go in real time from the field all the way up to the dashboard, or you can have this intermediate step in place uh, by authorized staff who can look at that, review it, change the status and move it on into that reporting structure or the analysis that, that takes place later. Um, that workflow is built on the existing ArcGIS capabilities for data management and quality control. And there are many at various tiers. So in the data tier, there are lots of different ways that you can ensure integrity, um, make sure that data is complete, geometry is complete, attributes are complete. Um, then when you publish and serve that data out to your users and, and even the public, you can make sure that there's metadata so that appropriate use of the data uh, is known. And then when you're visualizing the data, you can have it render at the appropriate scale so that if you're generating data at uh, a fine scale or a coarse scale, it's only used at, at the appropriate scales. And then in your dashboards, you can um, summarize and, and visualize the data so that management understands that they're only seeing the best data or the or the data that's been quality controlled. So there's a lot of different ways that in the in the management of the information and then it's its analysis and presentation, you can apply these different controls. So those are all built into ArcGIS um, and we use them in the solutions as well. Thanks very much, David. Uh, and this question to, to all, the, all the speakers that are online at the moment, this is one Susan shared area that I asked, but I wanted to repeat now. She asked, uh, to, to the presenters then, what's been the most surprising use uh, of, of GIS tools in the conservation space that you've seen? Uh, I think we've just seen some great examples that I would say surprise, but uh, continue to amaze me in the, what we can do with the imagery side of things. But just from the top of your head, uh, where have you seen the most surprising or, or fantastic use of GIS tools in the conservation space? Uh, David, I'll go to you first. Sure. Um... You know, before I joined Esri, I've been uh, using GIS in conservation. Um, I, I think when we were first developing the solutions, what was surprising to me was um, the use of geospatial technology with IoT. So we have a lot of conservation organizations, protected area managers that are putting in IoT networks in their parks and protected areas and they wanna bring all that data into their GIS um, to make use of it over time. So uh, that, that's that been really interesting. I think the other really Im impressive thing, uh, you know, from Tanapa, many, for many years, Tanapa has been using just a diversity of tools. So 
story maps, dashboards, the field applications. Um, that's really exciting to me to see an organization also like APW who take um, not just one tool available, but they start seeing the potential for all these tools to be used. Fantastic. And any other speakers uh, here in the panel at the moment just want to comment on the surprising use of GIS in conservation? Otherwise, I just have a couple more questions. Any other comment? Oh, great stuff. Well, we've seen some fantastic examples already today. Um, so one, uh, David, we've had a few questions obviously coming in in the chat on how can people access uh, these tools, technologies, and workflows? We've heard some of our presenters speak to the conservation grant. Uh, David, I didn't know if you just wanted to share a bit more on that for anyone who wants to get access to some of the things they've seen today. Yeah, um, many of the, well, the ArcGIS solutions for conservation are available in ArcGIS Online, and Esri's conservation grant program provides access um, to our ArcGIS Online software, a subscription for any organization doing protected area management or conservation in Africa, and that's a 10-year grant. So that is actually a, um, an excellent um, offering from Esri. Uh, some of the other tools like ArcGIS Pro that, uh, and the ArcGIS Enterprise tools that uh, African Parks uh, showed, those are also available through the conservation grant um, uh, to nonprofits through our through Esri's nonprofit organization program. So um, lots of different free and low cost options to access the software that you've seen today. And you can go to the um, esri.com slash conservation website to submit an application. Tell us about your organization, ask for whatever you need, and our team will review that very quickly and, and uh, get in touch. I believe Thank you Matt, very much, David. You, yeah, Matt, I think you already posted the link in the chat for the group, correct? Yeah, so it's all attendees. Yeah, there's lots of useful links in the chat, both to our speakers earlier, but also the resources that David had just mentioned and some others like uh, Africa Geo Portal as well, which is another entry point to some of this data. Um, just a quick opportunity, Vinay, as he's joined us uh, already in his presentation, highlighted a number of great data sets. Um, Vinay, if you just want to highlight a few that people can easily access uh, via the conservation grant and things like Africa Geo Portal, which are effectively ArcGIS online users, you put that really useful link at the end of your presentation, which we'll repost in the chat as well. But if you just want to highlight a few, thanks, Vinay. Okay, so we do have the, obviously we have the base map imagery, which is high resolution base map imagery. We can use that for context in your GIS. Um, then we've got the Landsat layers and we've got Sentinel layers. These are, although they're low resolution, it has a high temporal resolution. And it really goes back, like Landsat goes all the way back to 1975. And there are multiple bands as well, spectral bands. So there's heavy amount of analysis that you can do with these layers. Then we've got a bunch of landscape layers as well. So, you know, you can do um, landscape analysis, suitability analysis, and this different kinds of water analysis uh, with these different data sets. One other data set that I'd like to call out, and David Gatson could probably give us more information on that, is uh, Planet. They've made services available, WMTS services available through their NICFI program. So these services are available for free um, to your users for conservation purposes. That is another data set which I think you should completely leverage and it's accessible completely through the ArcGIS platform or the ArcGIS system. You can connect to it, connect to these WMTS services in ArcGIS Pro or in ArcGIS Online and use it for analysis purposes. Perfect, thank you very much, Vinay. And I've just posted a link to those resources 
um, in the uh, in the chat. So with that, I think lots of other questions, some of them quite specific technical questions, which the team will reach out back to individual people. Um, but on that, Pauline, back to you. Thanks, Matt. And thanks to the team um, of David, Matt, Lucy, and Vinay for the tech showcase that they've been able to give us. And just to emphasize that all of these uh, capabilities, um, they are available within our platform. And you could access some of the key capabilities using um, the link that we had shared, uh, where you can apply for the conservation grant and be able to tap into some of the tools that we are able to showcase through the tech showcase, as well as some of the things that the presenters had mentioned earlier on. So this concludes our summit program. We are so very grateful for participation and attention today. There are many ways to stay in touch with our team to receive regular updates from us. Please use the links above to sign up to our newsletter or to contribute your conservation success stories for promotion through our SG Conservation Marketing. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter. We would very much appreciate your feedback as to how to improve the event in future. As we mentioned earlier, this is just the first event of many more to come. Again, we wish you, your families and your communities, health and well-being during these challenging times. And again, thank you for your efforts to help conserve and sustain our natural world. From the ESRI team, thank you, and we look forward to engaging with you more.